Hey, everybody. Welcome to Market, Market Mavericks, where you kill them, we grill them, right, guys? That's what we're here to do. <laughs> um, hope everyone's doing well, but let's get right into it with no delays as we try to keep this to a, a quick 30-minute session. Um, what's going on with Bitcoin, Scott? Give me a rundown of Bitcoin's movement here over the last couple days. I'm looking at it as up only right now until these inflows change or we get some other kind of news. I'm not saying there won't be retraces. I'm not saying we won't see 25, 30, 35% retraces, but right now it's hard to argue with 500 to $700 million of inflows coming into these ETFs every day. We talked about on this show, actually, Gareth, quite a few times, this wick up on the ETF approval that moved to 49,000, how that popped right into that golden pocket through this resistance here at about 48,240. That's that 61.8% retracement that you saw in every single cycle, right? You have these four-year cycles of Bitcoin, you get this big move down, you know, 80%, whatever it is, and you always get that 61.8% retrace. Well, now we're pushing through that, right? We'll see where the weekly closes, but now we're through the golden pocket, continuing to head up. This thing is showing tremendous divergence strength. I think even though stocks are looking strong, I'm sure Mike will say that it's high beta, which may very be the very well be the case. But I just find it very hard to fade this when things are uh, looking this good. You know, you, just a really, really powerful move. And you look at the ETFs. I mean, you're talking about this is a screener for the ETFs. $5.7 billion in BlackRock already. $3.99 billion in Fidelity already. Now GBTC back up to $24 billion after going down to around 2021. Total market cap, $37 billion-ish. Of course, guys, to be clear, a lot of this has to do with the price going up. Right. That doesn't mean there's yeah. more Bitcoin in there for GBTC. It means the value of them is higher, but still just tremendously successful here. Do you think do you think that if we see like I mean, if there's something that that scares investors, that the the speed at which we're seeing the ETFs see flooding, flooding of money, will that stall out? I mean, is that a concern to you at all? Or or it's like I mean, I mean, we're talking near term, right? I mean, long term, I think we're all bullish on Bitcoin. Yeah, but, I, I, but I think near term, they'll slow. Um, mm -hmm. The question, I think, then becomes do prices do higher prices beget higher prices right we we all know in any asset but certainly in crypto people start to get really interested when the price goes up you know like you see the drake the drake meme where he's got his head and then he's like this you know hates it loves it well you hated it at 16k you love it at 50k right and then we all know that that's the that's the case here with bitcoin so the question is how much retail attention will this draw how much media mainstream attention will 50,000 headline or 60,000 headline what are those going to do to sort of continue to raise prices? Because we know as far as inflows, yeah, they could slow in the short term, but this product, these products are not even available to the bulk of RIA platforms, to the bulk of mm -hmm. institutions. It takes three to six months for them to even vet them and decide whether to list them. So what could potentially come? We're only seeing a small fraction of it so far. Is is this like so? Are, how, are you noticing that this is like the the mom and pops that are kind of talking about it now that the spot ETF is out, or is this more like like um, advisors, right? So is it, like I'm assuming there's a chain reaction, right? I'm sure maybe I, I, advisors first. Mike, I, I can yeah, I want to piggyback on that one. I went to ETF exchange this week, and one thing I really it's in Miami Beach. I enjoy riding the bike over here from over there from City Center. Um, and it, it, I've always enjoyed going there because after it used to be right after um, um, Bitcoin Miami, and you'd show, notice such a difference in suits and dresses versus the lambs in Bitcoin Miami, which is, you know, what is a lamb? A look at me. People wear outfits to make you look at them. But I was so impressed there with um, it was to me again, a bit of a game changer. There was one major panel on Tuesday morning with Eric Balchunas as the uh, uh, moderator and all the Bitcoin ETF people, um, Matt Hogan, um, Grayscale, and some of the main ones. And the room was packed. I mean, I, and so I went to check out another, the other significant event, and it was half full. So there was, I was impressed with that professional RIA. And there's a lot of Greylocks in that uh, room. All right, everybody's interested. I get the questions a lot. So, um, and to, to back you up, what you said, Scott, the inflows are happening. We all know the the the, the havings um, um, having. We we all know in the big picture, there's it's just a very bullish background, just declining demand and in, I'm sorry, increasing demand and diminishing supply. But what I saw there, I thought was quite striking. And one thing that really struck me was when I speak to a good friend of mine, Sal Gil Gilberti, who runs two Korean funds and some involvement in Bitcoin ETFs and stuff. And this, we go way back. We're really old school commodity guys. And his quote, we had lunch again. And the thing we both agree on is all commodities have the high price cure. That's the problem right now. It's part of the reason I'm 
bearish. I think more deflation's coming. That's why I'm bullish. Things like TLT and and bond yields go down, but. Bitcoin does not have that high price curve. You cannot create more of it. I mean, obviously there's other things you can sell or anything, but, and gold is the only one that's even close. So my takeaway from that event was, yes, there's this price is justified, can't fight the tape. But the key thing that really cautious me, and Scott, you touched on is both Bitcoin and the S&P 500 have a five handle on them. I mean, they're all still, at some point, I think we're already seeing some of that divergent strength where if we can see the S&P 500 at some point, it's gonna fill that gap at 4,600. We have a decade of trading, it's never left a gap like that. It's a question how it does and it's a question how Bitcoin reacts. And it's a trade for all of you, which I try to stay away from because I used to try to trade. But we are seeing that signs of people selling, and this is what I'm uh, selling gold, ETFs, gold, uh, gold, ETF, gold outflows remain, or the main gold, um, ETF, gold ETF, uh, um, ETFs remain in outflows. And um, people are selling stocks and gold to buy Bitcoin. Hmm. So, you know, it's interesting you say don't you can't fight the tape. And, and I agree with that to a certain level. But I, you know, you guys know I'm not shy of putting out where I'm positioning myself. And I will say that, you know, since we've crossed 50K, I've inched into a little bit of a short on Bitcoin. I picked it up, uh, I think, 50,000 uh, 100 and change. And then I added it 52, uh, 52,505. So my average is probably around 51, seven or something, but the, at least for me, and, and again, it's, it's become, I, I didn't realize I had this much power, but on Twitter, holy cow, like I have created a stir amongst the maxis. Like you wouldn't believe that I would oh, dare I saw short. Samson Mao didn't like they used a linear chart or something. Oh my know. goodness. Well, like, but, yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, but anyways, my, my point is I'm a swing trader, right? You guys know that yeah. I, I'm in and out and I'm left and right. So, so at least for me, look at this parallel. This is, I mean, I love my parallels. These things work so, so well, not saying it will work this time, but if you connect these lows going back to October of 2023 through the low that we just experienced on that drawdown from the spot ETF. We have now, look, one, two, and we're hitting. We just hit that at the high today again, and we'll see again if we pull back. And again, for me as a swing trader, we pull back to 47, I'm out. I'll take my 10% or so, and I'll, I'll move on. But it's just interesting in terms of that. And then you coexist that with something like a, an NVIDIA that is so high and is probably a good correlation to a risk on asset. And I'm curious if we do maybe do are due for a pullback off this 52, 553 level on Bitcoin. But anyways, just something to you, kind of, uh, kind of think uh, about. Well, sometimes the, uh, what I enjoy in this business sometimes in particular, what you said is the response you get from people when you get complete, um, abhorrence or people who completely disagree with it's just a little view or trade you express you know you're usually gonna be right yeah. <laughs> it's so funny <laughs> it's like and and then you know their position and it's just so entertaining that's what i'm really concerned about since the launch of the etfs it just it's just so overwhelmingly bullish that's when i have to pull back and be careful i've mentioned that but that's why i show you in this chart is can't fight what's happening what i've been concerned about is bitcoin gold ratio is breaking out the problem is it's catching up the s p 500 it's not leading it depends on how you measure it obviously i go back to kind of 2019 but what's significant lately as you see that's really happening i think it's going to really matter by the end of this year we're going to look back and say yeah prices were a little silly and i'm starting with risk assets bitcoin is just among the riskiest and as what you see here is this gap open in the s p minis once we hit that gap that's when we had a peak and Fed rate cut expectation. Now this is just S&P 500, I'm sorry, this is the S the uh, Fed funds in one year, what market expects in one year, going down mean taking out the rate cuts. The point is there's that cat and mouse game and I think it still goes back to what we talked about talked about a lot in the show, a lot of professional money managers, money managers realize you. Bitcoin thrives on, well, everything thrives on liquidity. And what this shows there's a higher, Risk assets go, S&P 500, the less li liquidity you should expect to come help save you. And that's why I'm still sticking with this. I think we're gonna just get a normal little pullback in the stock market, and then we'll see how everything pans out. So I'll end with this. Yeah. When the when, when the S&P 500 did this gap right here, Bitcoin was around 43,000. Um, 43, Let's see what happens. And of course, I might look back and say, I'm going, you're an idiot. And first time in, in, in a decade, it didn't feel it. I'm sorry, first time in a quarter century, it didn't feel it. But hey, you gotta go with the signals that work and make can make money. Interesting. I, I, Scott, are you trying to pull? I, I see you might be pulling something up here. Did you want to show well, yeah, something that, I, the, Just really interesting as to the power of these ETFs and where these flows are coming from. Bitcoin ETFs account for about 75% of new investments. So if you're wondering where this Bitcoin pump is coming from, and, and Mike, I think Dave Weisberger pointed it out to us yeah. on Monday when we spoke, 
This yeah. is not leverage. This is spot buying, forced spot buying by ETF issuers for people who are buying shares and they need to buy Bitcoin to fill it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's and, and, what this is, 75% of it. So yes, that may slow, but this is a demand dynamic that we have never seen in this market. Right. I'm not saying, clear. guys, I'm not doing that this time is different thing. I'm not saying we're right. going to 500,000 next week. I'm saying that there's a legitimate buying demand that is yet to cease at the moment in this market that has not been there before. Facts yeah, and the, the flows are so important. The one thing I will say about Bitcoin at 52-ish here where we are is that you're not seeing the same hype that you saw at 49 when the spot ETF was approved. Like, like those are the very obvious, like, okay, this is a pull, this is a top for a bigger pullback, like 20%, like we saw. Like, I don't think you're seeing that hype at this point where people are going nuts. Be interesting to see how high we have to go before that really starts kicking in. But yeah, definitely, definitely a good point there. Um, Mike, one thing and I was curious if you know about going back to gold is is gold do you have stats on like how invested are people in gold is it like a majorly underinvested asset yeah. at this point yeah uh, and uh, gareth i know you asked that question in a loaded way because you basically know the answer because i know how right. smart you know it's basically one of the most under underinvested assets the only way you were going to get gold inflows is you have to end one key fact about gold and that is the s p which chart i have i have it here someplace um the s p 500 um going up, interest rates in the U.S. at 5%, and the unstoppable dollar. I mean, there's no reason to be in gold when you're an, ET, an American-based investor when that's happening. That's got to change. So I'll start with, I just want to run through a few charts based on that. Is Just looking at, this is the, the what's happening with, uh, we'll just go with the gold. I, I actually show gold overlaid with the, the total public debt outstanding minus GDP in nominal dollars. Because I look at a percent too, but when I show it in nominal dollars overlaid with gold, um, it shows better chart. It's a little tech technique that you probably do learn, but I remember talking about with you know friends and stuff and colleagues in the trading pits. But gold to me is still it just had the first little bounce to dip below two thousand. Fully was kind of waiting for that and we'll seeing how it reacts. So it's it shows nothing nothing but upside for debt to GDP. I don't know how that changes, but I want to go over to something that kind of tilts over the cryptos. I'll be publishing on this tomorrow. Is we will be um, if you look at the Galaxy Digital's data on Tether. Tether, the number one, I, I call it crypto dollar, it's $100 billion now. Now, some other measures like in coin market cap and coin gecko, gecko, like just below $100 billion, but that's what I show you here. It shows the dollars an unstoppable force in terms of what's happening in cryptos. And I need our senior management, senior people to understand what's happening in this space. And Scott, you've done a lot of shows on this, but that's what I'm showing here is this is just the dollar overlaid with the increasing market cap of Tether. And I have to put it in log because it's going up so fast. Um, and then I want to show you the key thing that's happening in gold is in white. This is exchange traded fund total holdings and ounces. And what I messed up before is there's complete outflows. We never had that met much of outflows with the gold price still going up. And why is there outflows? Well, the stock market's going up and you you're getting 5% and who's buying gold? The deepest pockets on the planet, the central bank. So one thing I want to point out is to me, gold is on more sounder footings than it was at the onset of 2008, which it did have a 30% correction when everything collapsed and then went up. Remember, I was very long, anything but the stock market then, because I was just trying to hedge. One of those people was like Michael Burry, it was a little bit early. Um, but the key thing that's what's sounded footings is you look at the gold to S&P ratio, it's significant discounted now. Gold is so cheap versus S&P 500. Um, and here we are. It's also not anywhere nearly as expensive as it was at the start of um, 2008 versus it's, you know, it's, a, I'm, I use a 40 month moving average here because that's what really held then. It's basically unchanged. Gold is basically unchanged if you go back to like almost four years now. So that's nothing but upside. And I see, and here's, I'll kind of tilt over to what, I think it's going to really be a big story this year is just a little reversion in this trade TLT versus SPY. It's getting buried now. It's still early in the year, but those are the kind of thing that happens gradually and suddenly. And here we are, we still have interest rates extremely high, but I want to show you one thing from last year. What's the, the difference with, we got PPI tomorrow. If you take the average of PPI from the top four countries, US, uh, China, Japan, and Germany. By the way, Japan, latest tilting to recession. Germany, latest tilting towards recession. UK, latest tilting towards recession. China, well, they have to stimulate because there's a problem. PPI minus Fed funds, that disparity that's very con restrictive for economic growth is the widest in our database going, database going back at least 30 years. 
negatives. That shows severe deflationary forces and very restrictive monetary policy. So what I overlay with this, since I'm a commodity guy, I just show you, well, this is a Bloomberg commodity index. It's got a lot of room to get back to support. That's part of the reason I'm still, still in a very deflating environment, and uh, I don't see what's going to really stop it. So are you are you expecting, Mike, that tomorrow we get these big PPI numbers and it's, it's on the back of what we saw on CPI, which was a little bit of an uptick. So are you thinking the PPI numbers calm fears down and we see rates starting to come back in on that number? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm what we saw today in retail sales was one of the worst retail sales and post holidays. And I don't know how long it was pretty weak. And I think it's just a classic hangover. So just going I, I don't really care too much what ppi comes out to because that's really for the traders i look and actually i deliberately try to ignore it because having been in that space but i remember being in a trading pitch you just watch that number and then bam you're hitting bids or lifting offers right away i, I really enjoy kind of waiting back and letting the market adjust so what i look at here is this is this right now the fed the first rate cut is pushed out to june remember the beginning here is march and this is one thing we talk about a lot is how how many times scott i knew you would get this. how many times it's been almost a year and a half now we've, we've, we've been cutting at the next meeting for 18 months yeah <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's the point i think it's going to be 12. one of those gr gradually then suddenly there's no reason to cut and if they do they'll cut and be very patient i think see what happens just to make people happy but the latest cpi numbers core and I just and no reason to cut, but you're seeing a tilt in retail sales and you're seeing a tilt globally. That's what I showed you with this PPI chart. This is US is still negative, but China's minus 3%, Germany's minus, uh, Japan's minus, you know, and US is still minus. Okay, so that's only a year over year measure, but PPI to me is really commodities. We're seeing a little bounce in crude oil this year, uh, this month. So that's usually means people will be a little bit of an uptick, but I wanted to point out with, with crude oil, well, with copper, I, I guess I, my crude oil chart, I think I took off here, but I see crude oil bouncing around. Um, um, yeah. So here's my crude oil chart. Sure. I just want to show you the key thing to look about for inflation is let's look at the number one measure of heat, electricity, and fertilizer in this country, natural gas, the price right here, 159. The first day that futures traded in April, of 1990, the first closing price was 164, a higher price. That's severe deflation. So natural gas is collapsing. It's the highest volatility leading indicator for commodities. And to me, it's just a matter of time I see what I think it's going to do is make 80 in WTI is the new 100. 100 was the resistance right around here. I think it's now 80. And if you just look at natural gas now, easily WTI can get to 40. And all that's going to take is just a little blip, maybe just a little correction in the stock market. Um, and more the same, I, 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 at some point, a little bit of alleviation of geopolitical tensions. Interesting. Interesting. One thing I just want to point out, too, I have this chart up here. This is um, it's the chart of U6. Uh, and this is something I've been paying attention to is that if you, you know, COVID was kind of an outlier because it kind of popped out of nowhere, obviously, and, and surprised a lot of people. But if you look at U6 unemployment going back to pre 2007, 8, 9, right, the, the Great Recession, it started to uptick and it, it upticked for about 12 months before we went into recession. If you look yeah. at current U6, you're actually been upticking now for almost 12 months as well. And so there is this correlation with U6. And for those of you out there that don't know what U6 is, it's it's unemployment, basically people that are underemployed, right? So people that um, that they might want a full-time job, but they can't get it, so they take a part-time job. So technically, they're not unemployed. They're not counted with unemployment, but they're underemployed. And again, that's a good indicator of a potential upcoming recession is where companies might say, hey, listen, we don't want to fire this person, but we want to, you know, let's let's say, you know, we'll cut you back, your, your hours back, essentially. And that becomes that underemployed index. So just something to kind of keep Mike, in mind about. Mike talks about this all the time. Yeah. James Lavish yeah. talks about this all the time. Yeah. When unemployment goes up, it goes up fast, right? It's not, that's not yeah, what I'm yeah. showing here, but, but I, I think to your point, there's only really one way to go with unemployment at some point, And that's generally yeah. up. And if you dig into the numbers, I know zero hedge has been talking about this endlessly, but all the jobs have been created have been second and third jobs and to migrants and foreigners. So like your, your average American too, right? is not getting a new, like uh, first high paying job, but it's semantics. We know that they cook the numbers. This is sorry. This you just pulled up. I happen to have an Ethereum chart up. Sorry, but right now, I mean, when you look at these things, first of all, I, I was just looking at Bitcoin. Your your short is kind of maybe looking good in the short term if this daily candle ends up looking like this. I was hoping going back to it today. Yeah, yeah, but going back to Ethereum, when you look at this, I mean, to me, this looks like it's going to thirty five hundred bucks. I mean, I you know, I think it maybe three thousand is kind of a mild resistance, but I think it comes back and revisits those highs. I haven't even pulled the fibs, but I bet if you pull those same fibs we talked about. There's your 61.865, right? 3,400, 3,500. So I think ETH is, is lagging 
and should get mm -hmm. the same treatment as Bitcoin and should go up. And can we talk about Tesla? Because uh, if I was looking for a stock to buy right now, that would be it. Do you mind? Definitely. No, please go for it. Yeah, you take a look at the Tesla weekly chart, completely beaten down. Tech has been up. Tesla has been down. Bounced off a very key weekly resistance. When you dig in on the daily right here, I just love this. I happen to look at it. You have one of the clearest sort of inverse head and shoulders patterns breaking out right here. So I think just for the traders out there, listen, nothing's guaranteed, guys, right? But you have this big gap here. So you're looking at least, I think, 208. But if you pull the uh, this uh, bottom to the neckline and just uh, do the measured move, you're looking at Tesla up to about 220. So I think a really nice, you know, 20% trade opportunity on Tesla right now. I'm taking nice. it. Nice. Are there any, I mean, you're still in your TLT, I assume. I know you're sticking with that long term. I mean, term. yeah, I, I'm on um, Mike's premise that, uh, you know, first of all, TLT, we, we were buying so low that it would take a lot to shake me out of that, right? Because yeah. I think that even if the if the recession never comes, comes late, whatever it is, eventually bonds are heading up. And I'm in, in such a good entry that it doesn't matter to me if it's in three months, six months, or 12 months at this point. You know, Are there so, any um, other stocks that you've been kind of inching into or the nothing to, else? To, really be honest, to, to be honest, man, no, because I, I'm not so confident. I'm going to buy Tesla here. You know, uh, I bought a whole lot of, well, let me... Uh, uh, it, it shouldn't count because I, I end up buying all these crypto adjacent stocks, right? But uh, I bought coin because this is like the cleanest chart ever. And I had drawn this uh, in my newsletter actually in November, but you don't have a much cleaner resistance coming back to test. So yeah, when we got back down to 116 here, I added a ton to my coin position, which is looking good. And I'm buying still Bitcoin miners when they came on this dip. I bought more, more Iris Energy was the one that I've been... Uh, in and I, I bought more i was in down here wrote it back basically almost to my entry bought more and now almost back to the top these are extremely high beta to bitcoin but because i have conviction that bitcoin is bullish i like uh these stocks that can even outperform i think bitcoin on this move so there's a, there's a the saying I, I learned from farmers i want to just piggyback on you a little bit scott that's called uh, courage calls no when you're a farmer you never really want to be long dribs but sometimes you buy calls structure position because you completely sold out and you just want to make sure just in case corn drops jumps in only 20 another 20 percent you can buy that new tractor rather than being locked in i look at tlt as a classic example of a courage call partly because just imagine we're all looking at tesla imagine tesla looks like it's bottom what if that fails okay you got the and what if all this you get a little bit of a, re, a, a dip in all these risk assets which were way overdue that is what i see and that's what i kind of show you in this chart this is the potential advent of severe deflation i mean we are plenty ppi is deflating and interest rates are the highest ever versus in ppi of course it's only 30 years all you need is one little trigger and the number one trigger on the globe, on the planet, is the S&P 500 just backing up a little. That's the first mm -hmm. indication. Now, if Bitcoin's a leading indicator, I hope not, but that to me is, that is the domino fall that I'm really fully a fair, fearful of this year. And then you look at things that used to matter, the yield curve inverted, leading indicator stuff that, you know, maybe it's just a historic delayed reaction. Now, here's the key thing I want to end with is, we all know this, at this time last year, there was a decent amount of fear in the market. The consensus was recession. And we were at a 20% discount for all time highs in the uh, S&P 500. Right now, you can probably say we're at the exact opposite pendulum swing of that mantra a year ago. So I have a question, Mike. So, you know, I, I know you're hardcore on the deflationary aspect of what's coming, but but how do we get to a deflation when you have the government continuing to pass bills, massive spending bills and, and, and stimulating that way? And then, you know, you throw in other things like the stock market hitting new all time highs and these trillion dollar companies. I mean, you look at where NVIDIA was start of the year to now it's added almost a trillion dollars in market cap. You know, that's it. Does, it, does that not create inflation? So that's exactly what's happening. And that's what I wanted to show you in that and in, in this chart here. This is stock market going up, going up is taking away the the, ten, the potential for the Fed to ease. But it's what you pointed out that's significant. We basically the fact of this year of last year was we had about, about one point six trillion of nominal GDP growth, and that cost about two point five trillion of deficit spending. That's unsustainable. That's part of the reason to be long Bitcoin and, and gold in in the long term. But we're still well below GDP, debt to GDP in China and Japan and, and some of the other major current countries. But the key number one measure and definition, the way to have deflation is when you just go down from too high prices. The best example in our in history is the 1930s, the, the mm. um, Great Depression. Everything just went up too much. A lot of that was 
goosed upwards, but that is part of the issue. Deficit spending, the, what we had last year was the greatest amount of deficit spender, spending absent a recession or war ever in this country. That's from our economist, um, Anna Wong. Now, you make a good point. If we go into recession, yeah, there'll be more deficit spending, but it'll be well overwhelmed by, well, by severe deflationary forces. And just think of the um, most people probably listening to this chart ha have not had the experience of the NASDAQ or the S&P 500 going down 20% and the Fed saving you and then going down another 20% and then staying down. That always happens in history. It always will. In everyone's lifetime, it will happen if you hopefully you get old enough to live that to see those. And it hasn't happened in most people's lifetimes now that are trading cryptos. We're overdue for that. And I just think it's it's happening in China. China's in a complete depression. It's happening. Japan, it happened. We've seen it happen just coming out. In Europe, it's starting to happen. In this country, we're the shine. It's the nest. It's just the point I'm making is that's why it's so important for that S&P 500 to keep going, go, going up. And then I point out these simple little gaps that used to matter when I was a trader. Um, just a little feeling of that. The later it fills in the year, the worse. And then, of course, we have the, the election and everything. So it's just the point of deflation is when you just take asset prices that went up too much and revert. That's it. And we all know that um, free money and uh, most people in this trading cryptos, ha they, they are really good at experiencing big drawdowns in cryptos. But it's the fact of owning a home and watching it go down in value. Most people haven't experienced that, and that happens. Owning stocks in a broad market, the 401ks, I, you know, from from 2000 to 2013, I remember a pretty stagnant period there. So, uh, yeah, watching in, in your big, retirement, watching your retirement yeah. evaporate as you uh, approach that that's age. Scary. Is very so, so for me, that was kind of tough because that's when I was trying to put my kids through college. But you know, well, you know, that's how it works. But that's the point is right now, as I point out with with this this chart. Well, he, he, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I was going to say, were you trading in in 1987 when the stock market crashed? I actually was in Europe at the time. So I wasn't trading and it was a nice feeling. I started in the trading pits a year after. A year um, after. But, I was going to ask you if like, if there's any similarities between what's going on now and that or or any other similarities with the market, with, with things going on. No, not really. Back then, the, the, the dollar was collapsing. We did have some inflationary um, periods and the thing is the stock market was really cheap versus GDP <laughs> right now it's if you look at S&P 500 versus GDP I go back to 1928 in this chart um, it's the most expensive since the 30s <laughs> that's the big difference now of course and we just and we the difference is we have this we've had we're in the back end of this period that's never happened in history of zero interest rates and this is why I want to show you is this is the exorbitant privilege of the US this is the US stock market versus the MSCI X US index now before I show you it overlaid with this is the dollar index it usually have a pretty high correlation to the dollar index and it's been what's driving the dollar index up but what do you see now it's it's I can't hockey stick it's going straight up but the dollar index is like yeah I'm, I'm reluctantly following you're showing I'm just showing it um, versus commodities a little bit it's just at some point just a little reversion in this is pretty severe recession and pretty severe deflation and i like to point out is i show you here we're already getting pretty severe ppi deflation wow all right man scott what do you have up on your screen anything of interest there no not, nothing of, of major interest i was actually just kind of scanning and looking at the news while we were talking because you never know how fast this uh market will change on you. What I did really interesting before, Mike, what you were talking about with gold, I think gold has seen 3 billion in outflows yeah. from the ETF since the Bitcoin yeah. ETFs launched. I can't say if that's a, a function of the stock market doing well, which I think it more Probably is, not. or if that money's actually going into Bitcoin, but that's a, a interesting narrative that interesting. Bitcoiners are certainly pushing. But seeing the major outflows from the gold ETF, but I think yeah. to your point, that's more uh, with why would you be in gold right now? So, yeah, so I, well, you go, you go, Mike. Just I'll, I'll publish on that tomorrow. I still think if I'm right about this normal asset correction that there's a good potential gold will outperform Bitcoin. I've been wrong this year, but it's 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 you can clearly see there has been outflows. Gold ETFs are ETF holdings are still heading lower, and we know what's happening with Bitcoin ETF um, flows. But again, it's partly because beta is going up. All right. So last question as it's it's just about 3.30 here. If you guys had a million dollars that you had to put to work right now, what would be the three assets you would spread it amongst? Among. Sorry for throwing that. I didn't tell them I, ahead of time. I'll give you a, 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 a obnoxious answer. That's, of course um, you will, Mike. I would say um, T-bills, T-bills, and T-bills, partly because okay. um, there will be so many opportunities 
And I think the last thing you want to do is get overweighted risk assets. Um, that was the thing to do last year at this time. Right now, you're going to get 5%. You can at least say, okay, fine, I'll miss out. But that's what I would say is, and then Protection. have that, have that, now have that gunpowder when everybody is getting stopped out to be able to say, I'll buy this, I'll buy that, I'll buy this. And it's not even started. So I'd say people. What's my net worth? Yes. I have to ask you, I have to, I yeah. need a context question. I know we're out of time, but what's All my right, we'll net say worth? 10, 10, we'll say 10 million. So it's 10% of your net worth. If it's 10% of my <laughs> net worth, I would say Bitcoin, <laughs> Ethereum, and a small amount of treasuries. Because <laughs> I got, yeah, it's only 10% of my portfolio. And I believe there's tremendous upside long term in those. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, guys. Guys, everyone watching, by the way, huge group watching. I love seeing that. Thank you guys for tuning in. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, Scott and Mike, thank you guys. Make sure to follow these gentlemen, guys, on social media. And uh, we'll be back next week with another one. We'll talk to you later.